Yes, Miss Christmas. Thank you, my lord. Turning to Drea, Drea. tab yeah. 32 of the authority bundle, which is an authority on which Mr. Delamere places fairly significant reliance. Yes. The headline answer to his reliance on this case is that it's about a limb of the test, which isn't actually an issue. So, as Sorry, that the what test? The it's about a limb of the test, which isn't actually an issue in this case. So, to headline it, and going back to the classification of the test in paragraph 42.2 of my skeleton, what this case is about is the limb of the test which requires that a benefit is granted without any individual and discretionary assessment of personal needs on the basis of a legally defined position. There's no issue about the limb of that test in this case. All the comments that the court makes are addressed to that test and don't help with anything else. So to make that good, could I ask the court to look at... Paragraph 20, first of all, which is capturing the problem in that case, which is that Mr and Mrs Dreyer were held to be liable for various contributions to the French system. And they said, well, we shouldn't have to do that because Swiss legislation is applicable to us. And the National Court agreed except that the National Court wasn't sure if they might be required to contribute to one of the funds because the relevant benefits weren't Social Security benefits. Now, it's important to understand what this case is about, to look at the reason why the referring court wasn't sure if they were Social Security benefits or not. And if, if the court looks at paragraph 26 on page... 760, uh, start sorry with paragraph 25 which sets out the two conditions 1 and 2 so exactly as I've captured them in paragraph 42.2 of the skeleton the first condition is the legally defined position condition. The second one is relating to one of the risks. And then at paragraph 26, as you'll see that the, the court says at line three, the referring court considers that the second condition is satisfied. So there's no issue in this case about the second condition, which is the condition that's relevant here. However, it asks whether the first condition may be regarded as entirely satisfied. And then at paragraph 28, again, the court captures the question, and it's clearly related only to the first condition. So the referring court wishes to know, in essence, whether Article 3 must be interpreted as meaning that benefits, such as, and then those are the domestic benefits, may, for the purposes of their classification as social security contributions, be regarded as granted, and then states the first condition. Everything that follows relates to that question. Yeah. So that's really our answer to the reliance on Drea. It, it can't help with this case, and I, I won't take the court to it, but it's abundantly clear from the rest of the discussion that that's all that the case is deciding. See paragraphs 34 to 38. Yes, we've looked at those already, I think. Yes, and also see the, see the dispositive. And paragraph 39, again, it's relating to the same test. But there's nothing surprising about what the court says in paragraph 39, because that's the same for the UK benefits, which are similar. Yeah. So that's really the end of Drea. Doesn't help. Um, Mr. Delamere relies on it for saying Judge Jacobs went wrong in... Um, 
in his analysis, but Judge, ja Judge Jacobs didn't go wrong in, in not relying on a principle set out in a case which had no application to what's an issue. <coughs> so, just for completeness, wrapping up on this section about classification, there's a number of other cases in the bundle addressing family benefits, but they don't add anything for the reasons that the other cases don't. And just to finish this section, I'll, I'll just repeat what I said about classification, that this isn't really about classification at all. Um, the consequences, if child element is severed, cannot logically answer the prior question of whether it should be severed. So turning then to that question, and section five of my submissions, and I've already made the point that seminal as Mr Delamere says this issue is and as important it is it's not addressed at all in the regulation and that is for the reason I've given and the reason that the court has now seen in Hooks and other cases where the social security legislation covers benefits which um, address one of the risks so on this question of severability, which I have, I have described, we say more accurately, as whether this court can turn something into a benefit which isn't a benefit, we need to look at three authorities that the court has already seen, and I can take them more quickly. So beginning with Commission and Parliament, first of all in the AGO at tab 24, and it's a passage to which my Lord Lord Justice Lewison has, has already made reference, which is paragraph 22 of the Advocate General's opinion. So paragraph 22 is the information that the court has about DLA and it's the Advocate General saying disability living allowance consists of two components, a care component and a mobility component. Now could I just ask the court to keep a finger in that page and at this point, turn to tab 25, page 605, which is the relevant DLA legislation, the 1992 Act. So long before Commission and Parliament. Sorry, where are we going? 605? Keeping a finger in, in Commission and Parliament, but going to tab 26. Yeah, this is Bartlett. Bartlett. Um, paragraph 11, yes, we've looked page at... 605, because, yes. just to remind the court of what the legislation said. Yes, yes, we looked at that as yes. well. Yes, so where does the Advocate General get this reference to it consisting of two components from? It's the wording of the legislation. Mm. Now, all of this we know, if we now turn to 23, which is the, the judgment, and as Mr Delamere fairly pointed out, this is quite an unusual issue with a spat between various bodies um, and the Commission preserving its position in relation to legislation and then seeking to annul it, and obviously the court recognising that that had significant consequences for the Member States. So it, it was un, an unusual situation. Paragraph 20... Oh, sorry, I should start with paragraph 17 because it's right to note in relation to paragraph 617 that what the UK is taking issue with is annulling the whole thing. But what the UK isn't taking issue with in this case is treating the two components of disability allowance differently if its argument about the proper classification of the care component is not upheld. So at this point, the UK is faced with a situation where the Commission's saying, well, yeah, OK, mobility component, but the care component is not a sickness benefit. The UK's argument in this case is, yes, the care component, yes, the care component is a special non-contributory benefit, 
What it doesn't argue, though, is if we get that wrong, you can't treat them differently. It goes along with it. And, of course, that suits the UK because if it loses, it still gets one of them as a sickness benefit and only one of them as an SNCB. So it's important to understand there wasn't even really any argument about this issue. It's really a solution devised for this rather unusual situation. And then at paragraph 20, and this is the unfortunate thing about this case, a lot of it seems to be based on what the Commission has said in its pleadings, which we don't have. So the issue of the severability of the DLA had been mentioned in the Commission's pleadings. Now, one, one can only assume that that is the Commission saying, well, they're severable because there are two components and referring to the domestic legislation. Does the Advocate General say anything about the Commission's pleading? No, I don't, I don't recall that it does. It, it's all... It's all... If I can assist, my Lord, I think the reason there was little or no dispute is because the mobility component of DLA was the successor to uh, uh, incapacity benefit mobility component, which was what had been litigated in the case of Newton. And so the status of the mobility component, which had been tran trans transformed with relatively little change into DLA mobility component, had been established back in the Newton case. So, the, and the point I make, of course, is not, not so much that that wasn't in dispute, but that there wasn't an argument about this idea of severability per se, because it, it, if the UK lost on, on care, the reality is that it suited it. So, there's then a detailed discussion um, about whether or not these are SNCBs or sickness benefits. Again, the court will see at paragraph 56, page 492, a repeat of the formulation in HERPS about relating to one of the risks expressly listed in Article 4.1. That's at page 492 of the bundle. And then we get the remark at paragraph 69 that the mobility component is severable, so that that component alone could be included on the list in Annex 2A as amended if the UK decided to create an allowance which concerned that component alone. Now, like Mr Delamere, we say that one has to look at Bartlett, really, to, to understand, because the reality of Commission and Parliament is that at the time of Commission and Parliament, everybody knew what the UK legislation said and that it made clear that each could be claimed in its own right. The, the, the key point to make, therefore, is what Commission and Parliament and indeed Bartlett aren't doing is turning something into a benefit which is merely a calculation factor. It's probably also fair to say that some of the difficulty in getting to the bottom of this case, and I think this is a point that Mr Delamere made as well, is that severability could mean two different things. It can mean severability for the purpose of listing things in annexes, or it could mean what this appellant wants it to mean, which is splitting something into a new benefit when it isn't. And insofar as it's talking about that, we say but there wasn't really act any active severance because the legislation had already done that, the domestic legislation. So that's, that's all we say about Commission and Parliament. And then Bartlett at tab 20. Can, can I, sorry, can oh, I sir. ask you this? Yes. <clears throat> the court in Commission and Parliament had decided that the mobility component was severable. Why did they quash the whole entry? 
It sounds as though the United Kingdom wanted them only to quash part of it. What, that... the, U what the UK wanted was that it, it left it alone completely and treated them as, as care, treated them as sickness benefits. The, 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 the result of the case was that the entirety of the entry was deleted, subject to a temporal suspension. Yes. Um, so the court did not say, yes, we can sever this and leave the mobility allowance on the list, which doesn't lead to a clear conclusion that the court, the court can sever anything. Yes. And that, that, in my submission, reflects our point that there wasn't actually anything to sever <clears throat> because they could both be claimed independently in any event. And it, it's reflected in the fact that at no point did any legislation have to be amended. What had to happen in the end was that an appropriate entry was placed into the annex in the 883 regulation, which the court said was good enough, and that dealt with it. But at no point did the UK ever have to do anything to split up DLA because it, it, it was already like that. Because somebody could simply claim the mobility component or could simply mm. claim the care component. One or the other or both, but they covered quite different things. Yeah. Right. So turning to Bartlett, uh, Mr Delamere has helped me explain the background and I've shown the court paragraph 11, which is the legislation. So turning then to the reasoning, the first paragraph, paragraph 20 at page 608. court poses the first question it says is and, and paragraph 21 has to be read in this light it's first of all necessary to determine whether the mobility component of DLA can be regarded as a benefit on its own account so it's very much the question that I've been posing which is well is it a benefit on its own account already or is it just something else here a calculation factor and then when it's asking, answering, sorry, the question of whether it's a benefit on its own account, it then goes back to what the court held in Commission and Parliament, namely that the mobility component of DLA is severable. Now, we say that simply reflects the state of the legislation, which was that the two components could be claimed independently of one another and that a person could be entitled to, to one component or to both. What that doesn't do is say that that now establishes a test that any time that something could be included on the list if it was decided to set up a benefit in that way that means that, that the court can sever it. That's just not what this case is about. It's dealing with a very specific situation, and all this case is doing is reflecting the domestic legislation. And paragraph 21 repeats the wording in Commission and Parliament. But this, this then has to be read... Paragraph 23, they then say, OK, so it can constitute a benefit within the terms of the regulation. And because we don't have the observations, we don't know why the Commission said in Commission and Parliament it's severable, but the obvious implication is that it had the legislation, because it would have the legislation. And then paragraphs 31 and 32... Paragraph 31 is saying, well, the UK's done what it needs to do in terms of the sorting things out for EU law purposes. But then importantly, at paragraph 32, it says, DLA has always had two components clearly identified in the national legislation at issue in the main proceedings. 
So it had those two components at the time of commission and parliament. And the court, the, the, the clues in this case are paragraph 20, is it a benefit on its own account? And paragraph 32, it's always had two components clearly identified in the national legislation at issue. So can I just make sure I've un understood this? You say that Bartlett does not establish a test that if the social security system could be designed with a separate benefit, it should be treated as if the system had been designed in that way. Yes, or that it, yeah, exactly, yes. Because all that paragraph 21 is doing is reflecting what was said in Commission and Parliament, which related to the very specific circumstances of DLA. Yeah. And the courts directed itself to paragraph 11, what the legislation says, and paragraph 32, it makes clear that it's always had two components clearly identified in the national legislation issue in the main proceedings. And that is why the Commission said that it's severable. But at no point did this require the UK to change anything in its national legislation. It's just reflecting what the national legislation does. Now, universal credit is very different because you can't get the child element without, without getting universal credit. Universal credit is the benefit. So it's completely different from DLA. It's also completely different because it doesn't have this context of trying to sort out holding a position to reflect the decision of the court after all the legal wranglings. So we say all that Commission and Parliament and Bartlett do is reflect DLA and they don't establish any broader principle. And then Al Hashem, which is a case where I represented the Secretary of State and it's at tab 38 of the authority bundle. Uh, and in my submission, it, it, it can't be right to, to seek to undermine the court's reasoning on, on the grounds that the appellant threw in the argument as a last-minute thought. But the point, the point was argued and the court decided it. So one has, to, one has to read the court's answer at paragraph 53 with my submission at paragraph 53 two because the court agrees and I said two things it's not the sort of benefit that can be separated into component elements because it's part of the function that claimants should be able to move from one group to another that that's really a submission that it's all one benefit you can't split it up and then at, and the second bit of paragraph 52 she contrasts DLA where the benefit has distinct components, i.e. mobility and care. And of course, I was making the point that I'm making here, that in Commission and Parliament and Bartlett, it reflected the fact that they were two discrete claimable components under the domestic legislation. So that, that was the submission. And then the court agrees with it. And then the, the court says, it, it makes a comment about the Alamanovich case, but it says to, to split the benefit into two parts is inconsistent with the aim of it, which is in part to make the various groups porous so that over time individuals can move from one group to another. Now, yes, there, the idea was about moving from one group to the other, but it's fundamentally the same issue as here. In fact, here by stronger reason, because here the aim is that there should be one global benefit with the amounts being calibrated to reflect the circumstances of individuals. So splitting it up is inconsistent with the aim of the benefit. And in fact, although Mr Delamere said, well, it's different because people can move between groups, of course, people can have children, um, people can not have children, and then they can have children. But, but groups is not really the point. It's a red herring. It's about looking at the benefit and saying, well, can it be split up like that? No. So Al Hashem is powerful authority, we say. I accept the facts are different, but we say it's a fortiori here. And in terms of the submission that the test in Bartlett was insurmountable in this case, two responses to that. One, there's no test in Bartlett along the lines that Mr Delamere submits there is. And second, for the reason I've just submitted, the outcome in this case is a fortiori with Al Hashem because 
as the court has now heard, there are that there is a complicated calculation exercise with various consequences to arrive at an amount. And to strip that out is to undermine the aim of the benefit, which is to have a single global benefit. So those are the cases on severability or turning a benefit into a benefit when it isn't. Can I then make three points to draw strands together on that issue? The first is that Commission and Parliament was addressing a very particular situation. So a solution that the court devised to deal with a rather unusual issue. Second, the reason that the solution worked is because it didn't involve any changes to domestic law, as we've seen. Essentially, the court's analysis starts and ends with domestic law. Here, there would need to be extensive fiddling with domestic law. So, Commission and Parliament respects the coordination principle, it respects national legislation, it reflects what national legislation already does. It basically, it basically asks, is, is, this, is the mobility component a benefit on its own account? And it answers that question, yes. But here, that question can't be answered, yes. So that's the second point. And then the third point, and fundamentally, is nothing in Commission and Parliament and Bartlett even begins to decide that if you have a general social benefit but you get more money for one of the reasons in Article 3 that that bit must be split off and treated as a benefit in its own right. Yeah. So just, just to address the practical consequences now because for the reason I submitted at the beginning, we say, actually, no, this, this rather proves the point that the court's being asked to harmonise or devise rather than to coordinate. We've set out several consequences in our skeleton argument. And it's unfortunate that Mr Delamere criticised the analysis in such trenchant terms, because as I submitted earlier, those instructing me in good faith and given their knowledge and experience of this system have come to a view naturally in the course of considering this case about what the consequences would be. And they are broken down at paragraph 6, 60 and 61 of the skeleton. So could I just go through them in turn? The first is that, and, and this stands in stark contrast to Commission and Parliament where nobody had to do anything, the first is that the claims and decision-making process is going to need to be re redesigned so that you can have an applicable law competence check. The reason that that would need to happen is because the provisions on applicable law are mandatory. Now, that means even if, as a member state, you want to be generous and pay benefit when your law isn't applicable, you can't save in very special circumstances. I haven't troubled the court with that case law. It's all discussed in Carrington. So that would have to happen. What would also have to happen is the setting up of administrative processes so that you could liaise with other member states to get information from them about other people's positions. And there's a whole separate regulation, the implementing regulation, which deals with those kind of questions. Third, we've said that you would also need to make more radical alterations to the conditions for the reason I've given, because otherwise somebody would get too much money. Because at the moment, if they were treated as being responsible for a child not living here, that would affect their accommodation costs, or they might get a work allowance to which they shouldn't really be entitled. Amendment might also be needed to address the losers. So the people who are going to lose out, who might be receiving universal credit now, the UK would need to think what to do about those. Um, and then fifth and finally, the logical consequence of Mr Delamere's submission is that it doesn't just apply 
to the child amount, it, it, he, he's dealt with housing, but, but there are other there are other reasons that the amount gets increased. So, for example, sickness, unemployment, are those bits now to be split off and turned into benefits because the UK can't have a global uh, social benefit? So, so those are the consequences, and it doesn't answer the point. So, oh, well, that's the consequence of the law. It would be the consequence of a harmonising law, but it can't be the consequence of a coordinating law. I'm right in thinking there's no witness statement which explains this. I'm not trying to be critical. This is this reflects the government's considered view of the implications. Yes, and it and it also reflects the the law in effect because it it just it. Those are the legal consequences that would need to be addressed. So in that sense, it, it it's a submission as opposed to, as opposed to evidence because the consequences are indisputably as a matter of law. You would need to check applicable law because you're not entitled to pay people if your law isn't applicable to them. Indisputably, at the moment, the legislation works that way, so it would need to be amended. Um, indisputably, there would be losers. We say so that that would need to be. But all of those things, and, and I showed the court the interlocking. And the who are the losers? So it's de that's dealt with in our skeleton. So, for example, somebody now might be receiving universal credit. This, this is, I think it's paragraph 34, yes. So suppose for now there's somebody living in the UK with their child, um, but they have a partner living and working in the EU, and the EU state pays family benefits. The primary position there, then, is that they wouldn't get the child amount um, subject to any topping up under the priority rules. So that would need to be investigated. There's somebody at the moment in that situation will get the child amount, and they're not affected by the fact that their partner might also be getting so child benefit in another state. Are you referring to Article 68? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I refer to paying by the UK as a supplement, there's quite complicated provisions for family benefit where... You've got so just go back to Mr. De La Mare's example, but in reverse. You've got somebody who lives in Northern Ireland, but whose partner is working in Southern Ireland. Yep. The UK resident gets child benefit yes. at the moment, but if child benefit were child split, element. child element yes. was split off. Yes. Then it would be Irish law that governs. Is that, that your point? And yes. And the partner in, in the UK would cease to receive that element of universal credit, what, which is what, the child element. What is would that? happen is that there would be two rival states. Right. And then there, there are provisions in Article 68 which determine priority. So in the example that we give, the state where the person is working would have priority. But then if it was less than the UK amount, the UK would pay a supplement. But that person would be a loser because at the moment there's no looking at what a partner who's working elsewhere might get. They just, does that not mean that there would be no losers because there'll always be a top up if the other member state is paying less? And if the other member state is paying more, well, that's all to the good. Well, no, in the sense that it's not, it's not even looked at at all at the moment. So that they might get the whole lot. Yeah. So the, the point is, as I made clear this morning, it's exactly like the case d'assurance case, where you have to apply the top-up benefit rules. You have to ask whether or not the benefit that's also being paid in a foreign member state is a coordinated benefit, and if it is, then you apply the coordinated benefit to, rules to ensure that you don't pay too much. It's a, it's a situation specifically provided for by the directive and adverted to in the recitals I showed you when opening the case and say, because of lots of things of family benefits, there needs to be an enhanced yeah. overlapping benefit rule. But, but the fact that it's specifically provided for doesn't mean that there aren't losers. Yeah. Because at the moment, if somebody's partner is, say, working in France and France gives £500 a month, that won't even be looked at. The way that universal credit works is it's an in-country subsistence benefit. So it's looking at providing subsistence for somebody living in the UK, which yeah. is why it looks at the child. So... Under Mr. Under Mr. Delamere's scenario, yes, they they would that that five hundred pounds would be looked at. Whereas now, the person would get the child amount simply by virtue of the fact that the child is living with them, without the analysis under Article sixty eight. Yes, I see. Yeah, that's great. So. 
to answer to answer Mr. Delamere's point in a nutshell, what he says is, well, it's not complicated. Just go back to the situation where you have child tax credit. It was all easy then. <coughs> HMRC managed to do it. Well, of course, yes, that that was what happened. It was a separate benefit. But our point is that that involves requiring us to make it a separate benefit. Yeah. The question is, can it be done under the system as it is now? And the answer to that is no. It would have to be amended. The other point, of course, is that I've shown the court the policy materials which which discuss the problems with the previous system. And that wasn't just problems for the Secretary of State, it was problems for claimants. Mm. So what it would do is go back to a system which Parliament has decided didn't work anymore. Yeah. So that really is... is what the court is being asked to do. Right. So that then takes me into some specific submissions made by the appellant um, and some mop-up points. So starting first of all with the child tax credit issue, and a lot of emphasis has been placed on case law which discusses child tax credit, which deals with the position so far as the coordination legislation is concerned. I've already said that the Commission in the UK didn't establish anything. There's no dispute. It was Child tax credit was always expect, accepted to be a family benefit by the UK because it covered one of the specific risks. Yeah. What Commission in the UK was about, and the reason that it was so interesting for anyone working in this particular area... <laughs> is that that's a big group uh, it's, a, a, it's a leap even <laughs> yes I, I use the word interesting loosely um, <laughs> and until that point that the, everyone had in their mind the division between social assistance regulated by the citizens rights provisions and social security and what was so interesting about Commissioner in UK was where it was a social security benefit could the, could the state say, well, I'm entitled to impose a right to reside test? In other words, I'm entitled to require you to be residing lawfully in my state. And the Commission said, no, you can't. That interferes with the one applicable legislation principle. The court said, no, that's wrong. What the applicable legislation principle does is tell you which legislation applies. It doesn't tell you what the content of the legislation should be. And if you... if if the court reads Commission and Parliament, it, it, the, the court will see that that's what it was. That was the main issue. That was the Commission's main argument. You mean Commission and UK? Commission and UK, yes, um, which is at tab thirty-one. And the second argument, the Commission's backup argument, was that it was discriminatory to have in relation to family benefits a right to reside test. And the court said, no, it's not. The state's entitled to do that. So the reason that it was interesting was was that actually these principles about being able to protect your public finances read across to benefits protected by or falling within the Social Security Coordination legislation. There was nothing in it about whether or not child tax credit was a family benefit, because we'd already accepted that. The second point to make on the child tax credit issue, and we are going to produce a note from the court on this, Mr... Um, McKay, my junior, has been working hard on it. Right. It has to go through clearances at the department. I'm very grateful. Um, We're not doing an extemporary judgment. <laughs> I did get very disappointed to hear that. <laughs> um, we, we, we're getting on with it. We, we hope we should be able to get it to the court by closing Monday at the latest. If that would assist, that, that's within yeah, seven that's days fine. of receiving it. I'm grateful. But, but what we say at a headline level is we, we don't dispute that there are similarities or that universal credit borrows from the previous legislation. And indeed, it would be surprising if it didn't. The headline response is that all of that is irrelevant. The history, the fact that there was once a benefit which covered one of the specific risks, doesn't help you with the question of, well, what about this new benefit that doesn't cover one of the specific risks? It can't. Otherwise, the member states would be in a straitjacket. Once they created a social security benefit, they would then have to keep it. So what, what the court has seen in the cases is that you have to look at the benefit that you're dealing with, its purpose, and the conditions for its grant. The court's not been shown a single case, because there isn't one, 
where the court decides that question by reference to a predecessor benefit. And to do that would be fundamentally inconsistent with the test, which requires you to look at national legislation. Now, the reality is that there is a major difference between child tax credit and the child element or the child amount. And it's this. It's that child tax credit was an actual benefit, claimable in its own right, which met one of the specific risks in Article 3. The child element is not claimable in, in its own right. It's just a calculation factor. So unless and until it is a benefit in its own right, on its own account, see Bartlett, it's fundamentally different from child tax credit. So it simply doesn't help to say, well, look, we did it that way before. That's how you should do it now. Well, that's not how we want to do it now because we looked at things and decided that they didn't work very well. But there is that fundamental difference between them. One was a benefit, the child element isn't. So, as I've submitted, it, it, it can't be right um, to say that because it was previously a separate benefit, it has to be severed, because that's to impose a particular form of structuring benefit system on the state, rather than respecting its actual system. It basically is to say you can't have global benefits like this You've got to split it out. Anytime you're giving some money to reflect the fact that somebody has children, you've got to turn it into a new benefit. So that's our answer, really, to the reliance on the child tax credit. We say that goes nowhere. Um, as to the Delphic comment of the Advocate General in C. Jim, uh, I was there. <laughs> I was being led by Mr. Blundell. It wasn't an issue in the case at all. I don't know why the Advocate General said it. Um, it's very difficult to know why the Advocate General said it. Certainly the UK didn't make any arguments about it and the court didn't hear arguments from the UK on the point. It's, it's a Delphic reference um, which wasn't taken up by the court. Had there been the argument, had there been argument about it, the Secretary of State would have made the points that are being made now, which is, that's wrong. Mm. So... We say it, it doesn't really get any get anyone anywhere. I don't think this case is going to turn off. No, it's, it's an odd comment. Um, don't really know what he means, but it's wrong. <coughs> it seems to have come from nowhere. <coughs> but what I will show the court in CG, just for completeness, since we've looked at it, is that it's a tab... It's a tab 36... Before I ask the court to read this, could I just be clear that it is not and never has been the Secretary of State's case that universal credit is social assistance as that term is used in the coordination legislation. But it is its position that it's social assistance so far as the citizens' rights provisions are concerned. Could I just ask the court to read paragraph 69 to 71 at pages 841 to 842? Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. A report has been received of a suspected fire in the main building. This is being investigated by the security fire team. All fire evacuation and first aid officers to alert status. Please stand by for a further announcement and obey the instructions of your local evacuation officer. Attention, please. Attention, please. 
This is the incident control officer. A report has been received of a suspected fire in the main building. This is being investigated by the security fire team. All fire evacuation and first aid officers to alert status. Please stand by for a further announcement and obey the instructions of your local evacuation officer. Right, we've read those paragraphs. What do you get out of them? Uh, it's a simple point. It's really reflecting the sort of description that I showed the court in Hux, which is that this is effectively a general social benefit. Yeah. That's all. So just a couple of mop-up points. First, I thought something I should have mentioned when I was dealing with Regulation 4 of the Universal Credit Regulations, which is the provision, if I could just ask the court to turn it up. Tab 8. Tab 8. Tab 8. Yes. So page 101, when a person is responsible for a child or qualifying young person, and the, the provision being a person is responsible for a child or qualifying young person who normally lives with them, it's just to flag a point that we made in our skeleton at, at paragraph 28.1, which is that this applies across the board. So if, for example, somebody living in London thought, well, I might quite like to send my child to this school in Newcastle, and that's where my parents live, so let me send the child to go and live with the parents in Newcastle, it would bite just in the same way as it bites on Miss Simcova. So it, just, just so the court, that's, I'm not, I, I don't say that there's anything that turns particularly on that. It, it would if, if a discrimination argument were made, potentially. Um, but that's the way the legislation works. And it reflects the fact, the fact that it's the same for UK nationals really reflects the structure and intention behind the benefit, which is that it's reflecting the cost of the actual household. Yeah. Finally, I should just deal with ground three, which is if it splits off, is it a family benefit? Now, our answer to this is really, well, the question just doesn't arise. Uh, we also say that there would need to be so much fiddling with domestic legislation that the Secretary of State would have to go back to the drawing board, and at that point, you'd have to classify whatever the outcome of all of that fiddling was on its own terms. But we don't really say more than that. We accept that child tax credit is a family benefit, but we say <coughs> ground three doesn't arise. So at that point, then, just to draw the strands together before I come on to the reference issue, we say that when one actually looks at the cases properly, looks at what they're about, looks at the test, looks at the facts of those cases and the issues in them, it's clear that this case is based on the thinnest possible material. First of all, there's nothing in the coordination regulation which provides for what the appellant is advocating, despite it being a radical interference with a member state's ability to... Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. The emergency condition has been resolved. The building is declared safe. All personnel may return to normal duties. All key emergency staff, please report to the main hall for debriefing. Attention, please. Attention, please. This is the incident control officer. The emergency condition has been resolved. The building is declared safe. All personnel may return to normal duties. All key emergency staff, please report to the main hall for debriefing. I think she only says it twice, so I think we can carry on. <laughs> Did someone tip them off and say they'll need a break for Miss Smythe's submissions about <laughs> social security coordination? <laughs> um, so, yes, that's the first point. If, if, if this was a thing, it would be addressed in the legislation. All that the legislation says is Article 3, and we see that backed mm. up in the case law, it's legislation which addresses one of the specific risks. 
The second point is that this is not an unusual situation. Other member states do it. Um, it's not avoidance. It, it, it's simply organising a social security system in a particular way. There's no case where the court has ever done what this appellant is inviting the court to do, which is basically to ignore domestic legislation and the fact that something isn't a benefit and treat it as a benefit. It's just never happened in all the decades of operation of the social security legislation. The reason it hasn't happened is because it's wrong, uh, because one has to look at the national legislation, not a different version of it. Uh, the only argument turns on Commission and Parliament, and as I've submitted, that was very specific, and the benefits under domestic law were completely different. Yeah. The final point I make is that the court has been taken to lots of cases addressing different legal issues and different benefits, and said that they go to that particular issue, the severability issue, um, but they don't assist on that point. So we say that the judge was right. In terms of the specific picking apart of bits and pieces in the decision, the starting point, of course, is this is an appeal against the judge's decision. Mm -hmm. Appeals are against decisions, not reasons, although one, one of course, has to scrutinise the reason. But the fundamental question here is, did, did the upper tribunal get this right? Did it get it right to say, actually, no, I can't do what you're asking me to do, which is to treat the child element as a benefit in its own right, um, because the case law and the coordination legislation doesn't require me to do that. And that's exactly what he said. And if one looks at the heart of the upper tribunal's conclusion, core bundle, <coughs> core bundle, um, page 98, tab 13, is the core of the reasoning. It says, yes, it's, so paragraph 47, yes, it's the descendant of child tax credit, but I don't accept the argument that it's a discrete element um, and that the drafting shows each entitlement can be considered individually. The elements are not entitlements, they are amounts that form one part of a calculation that's subject to deduction. Yeah. What it's what it's really saying is that this is all one benefit. You can't and the judge goes on to say this. No, I can't do what you're asking me to do, which is split it off into a separate benefit. And that's captured in his reasoning at paragraph forty eight that the child element of universal can't be severed because it's too embedded in the complicated structure of the calculation of entitlement to universal credit. So in other words, exactly as I've said, it's not like Commission and Parliament. It's all one benefit. That's really what the judge is saying. There have been various criticisms of the way he put things, but we submit that if one looks at the directions that he gave himself and the way that he explores the case law, he deals with the case of Hooks, which is clearly important here, saying it, addressing um, general social benefits. And his comment of paragraph 32 makes sense if it's read in the light of the case of Hooks. I think if I've understood your submissions correctly, you would say that in paragraph 48, Judge Jacobs is a bit too generous to the appellant in dealing with severance or severing. Well, I think we've all called it severing, but one has to be clear what one means yeah. about severing. It, it's turning something into a new benefit, which is what, which is what the argument was, and, and everyone was using the language of severing. Yeah. But one has to actually spell out what that means. It means severing and make it a new benefit. So one... Right, so I see. So he, when he says regulation 883 takes domestic law and classifies it. Yes. So when, when he's talking about severing, that's severing domestic law. Is yes, it? Yeah. Se severing and turning it into something that it isn't. And then he says, but it can't involve rewriting domestic law. Absolutely right. Yeah. I agree with Mr Delamere that national law has to be disregarded, disapplied to the extent that it's consistent, inconsistent with the regulation. But that's not... Judge Jacobs knows that. There's a whole series of decisions hmm. where Judge Jacobs has done exactly that. What he's saying is, but when you're asked, what you're asking me to do is to rewrite domestic law. That's the point he's making yeah. in paragraph 48. That's all he's saying. Um, and that then he says, and he says it 
neatly, it, it, it's too embedded in the complicated structure, and, and com compare mm. that to Commission and Parliament. Mm. And then Mr Delamere criticised the judge. He says the, the errors that he made are compounded by the failure to give effect to DREA and Commission in the UK, which say means testing and tapering are not relevant to categorisation. Well, I've already addressed that. Yeah, you have. Um, and then paragraph 49 is, is simply making a general remark about universal credit as a whole. And um, we... The language can be used in different contexts, but the judge is, is addressing various different points. None of that <coughs> affects his analysis in paragraph 47 and 48. Yes. So we say he, he's got the answer right. So that those are my submissions on the substance, and I can now turn to the reference issue. Yeah. So the first submission is that there is no need for a reference. Well, I follow that. The whole, this whole discussion takes place on the basis that we, we're not sure what the answer is. Yes, but we say one, once one starts bringing into it cases that are actually about different issues, there isn't any difficulty here. Yeah. That's the first point. The second point, and our fundamental point, is, is about the language and, and what can actually be referred. So could I then ask the court to turn up the withdrawal agreement? which is at tab 17, and article 158, which is at page 348. Submission is that no question is raised concerning the interpretation of part two of the agreement in this case because it wasn't in force at the date of the Secretary of State's decision, and that is the date that the court has to look at under section 12.8b. So what the court is doing is looking at the law as it applied at the date of the Secretary of State's decision, which is the 17th of October 2019. Well, at that point, the relevant provisions of Part 2 were not in force. Uh, before, effectively before Brexit. It's not. It's not before Brexit. Well, it's before it's the end of the transition. Well, actually, it is before exit. Yes, it's before exit, and it's before the end of the transition yeah. period. So, we say quite simply, a question can't be raised concerning the interpretation of part two of the agreement in circumstances where it isn't an issue before the court, as it isn't in this case because it wasn't in force. It's really a very simple point. So, if if if, uh, if the dispute between um, Secretary of State and Miss Simcova had reached the courts a bit earlier, there could have been a reference, but because it didn't, we can't. Yes, and that, that there are all sorts of consequences of exit, which... Uh, and that, you say that's simply that that's that's one of the reasons that the UK left the EU. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think the point is this, that the parties have to grapple with where are we going to draw lines? And there have been other cases reached this court about different issues about where lines were drawn and submissions having been made on both sides about, well, it must have been drawn here, it must have been drawn there. The, the, the position is, straightforwardly, that a line was drawn. And the line was drawn in terms of saying, well, if the case raises an issue about the interpretation of part two, you can refer it. But if it doesn't, then you can't because that ability to make references stops at the end of the transition period. And yes, it could have been negotiated differently, but it wasn't. And as we've said in paragraph 69 of our skeleton, it isn't actually that anomalous, despite the fact that it means that some, in some cases there can't be a reference, but it isn't that anomalous to say, OK, let's, let's stop references being able to be made on the 31st of December, even though issues might arise in cases, as it does in this case, about the impact of EU law. Why would the court do that? Not I'm sorry, the, the UK parties. do that. 
Because what, it's why? Because, because it's policy? because it's winding down its relationship with the CJU and there has to be an end point somewhere. And this is international law. I mean, what they did was get rid of European law and deal with it through retained law at the time. Then they created an international law treaty, the WA and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and they created separate dispute resolution procedures. And it was just logical, and they agreed after a lot of tug of war, that they were going to use the Court of Justice. So... And it's for benefits for both sides, European residents coming here, British residents abroad. What, why in that circumstance would it be logical to create this little gap in the middle? Well, there has to be a cut-off somewhere. Um, and, and that's so where... This is in the middle. Well, well, no, in the sense that it, it, questions concerning the interpretation of Part 2, which comes into force after the end of the transition period, the only issue is should it have allowed references to continue to be made in cases which raised issues of pure EU law, as in this case, because we're looking at the position in Oct October 2019, should it have allowed references in those cases where there weren't issues about the interpretation of Part 2, but there were just issues about EU law, and if so, for how long? Well, it decided until the end of the transition period that, that they could have decided, well, yes, we'll allow those to go on for two years after the end of the transition period, but they didn't. Similarly, one might say, well, why stop for eight years? For interpretation of part two, there might be cases coming to light after 10 years. Let me also do something entirely pragmatic. Let's assume the premises that we are completely assume we don't know what the answer is and we want to send it off somewhere else. So that's a premise which yes. we may or may not get to. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> wouldn't the sensible thing, pragmatic thing to do, just to ask us question one, do you have jurisdiction? Because from one view, if you ask the European Court, do they have jurisdiction? They may just simply say, of course, apply the purpose of construction. Or they may take your view. Is it, isn't this a little bit academic? Because if, and I recognise it's a big if, if we were minded to go down that route, the solution is just simply say to the court, you decide. If you want to send it back to us, fine, then we will sort it out, notwithstanding the complications. Doesn't that rather cut through it? Well, I don't, I, yes, I, I can't really say any more than I've said, because we say there's no jurisdiction to refer, and then the court says, well, we're going to ask the court if there's jurisdiction <laughs> to refer. Um, I suspect those sitting behind me would say, well, there isn't jurisdiction to ask if there's jurisdiction. Well, they used to have that under the old 177, go back a long time. They used to regularly be asked, yes. for example, you know, references. I remember a very early case from a tribunal. The court? question was, was it a court? And they said, well, we have jurisdiction to decide our own jurisdiction. And therefore, we decide we have. Yes, <laughs> although, <surprise. laughs> yes, although that, of course, was in was in the old days, whereas now we're in, we're in a different world, so it can't <laughs> take jurisdiction in the same way. I think the other point I should also make, just on this, for, for, for completeness and for the sake of clarity, is that Article Four Three, and this is to pick up a question from my lady, uh, Lady Justice Elizabeth Lang, is that. Article 4.3 is quite specific in terms of interpretation, and that appears on page 322. And, and what that says quite specifically is that the provisions of this agreement referring to union law or to concepts or provisions thereof shall be interpreted and applied in accordance with the method and general principles of union law. So it is only those provisions which are referring to union law or to concepts or provisions thereof. And I know um, that my Lord Lord Justice Green decided that question against the Secretary of State in AT, but of course the court did decide in AT that there was an issue, there was interpretation or application of EU law. It doesn't, it doesn't go further than that. So I do make that point. Yeah. Can I ask a stupid question? Um, could you just tell me which provision of domestic law, I'm sure it's in the bundle, um, brings the withdrawal agreement into domestic law? Section 7A, isn't it, of the 2018 Act? Yes. Thank you. The European Union Withdrawal Act 18. And then the there are specific provisions which bring the relevant part, which is part two, into effect from the end of the transition period. Yes, I think I we um, Article One Eight Five. 
of the withdrawal agreement, entry into force and application, which is the which is the part that, that makes clear that article, uh, sorry, part two, which is the provisions title three of part two, which deals with social security coordination, that those weren't in force on the day of the Secretary of State's decision. Yeah. And the one thing, if we, if, 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 if underlined in bold, there was a reference, we'd have, it would have to be about the interpretation of part two. Yes, it does. It would really have to be about scope and effect of Article 67 and the definitions relating to it and family benefits and that kind of thing. Have to focus upon that. Yes. Do, do, does regulation 833 apply? Is yes. Really it, question, isn't it? I think we'd accept that it, it wouldn't simply need to be focused on Article 67 as such, but it, it could be about the regulation insofar as it continues mm -hmm. to apply. It, it, it's yeah, our your, point your, in terms your of... primary submission is it just ain't necessary. Yes, clearly. And and second, it, it, it wasn't in force at the relevant time. Yes. Uh, can I turn my back for a moment? Mm. Yeah. No. So there are just, uh, there's just one final point, which is the evidence application, which has been dealt with by a special bundle. Um, it relates to Mr Delamere's application to put in evidence about the position after the end of the withdrawal agreement, and our answer to that is set out in two letters in the bundle. At the, I think it's called the application bundle at pages 42 to 43 and 46 to 47. Essentially, what we say is that the evidence isn't relevant because this court can only look at circumstances as at the date of the decision. So I, I promise. It doesn't don't change think. anything, though, does it? it? Mr. Delamere wants it there so that he can say there's an ongoing issue after the end of the transition period, so that it helps his case on reference. And we say, well, yes, but that wasn't in force. Um, this court is bound to look at the position only as at the date of the decision. Well, that's for deciding whether the Secretary of State was right or wrong. Yes, exactly. So but if we're, if we're looking at whether there should be a reference, we may be entitled to look at well, that's other, it, other material. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think if the court rejects my case on the reference issue and says, well, we are deciding an issue about interpretation of part two, then I accept that the evidence would be relevant to that. Our point hmm. is... And what we always had the situation in the good or bad old days, depending upon your perspective, that if there was a reference, you could say anything you liked on the reference, and so people did, and put in new evidence to Luxembourg, and what happened in the National Report was irrelevant. So yes. there's little point in keeping stuff out if there's a reference. <laughs> yes. Bold and underlined. <laughs> and with Bold. Yes, so I made good time. But I, I emphasise that that should not give Mr Delamere <laughs> extra time, um, though I'm sure he will, he may try to take it. But can I assist the court? Can I assist the court? <laughs> so hard. <laughs> can, can I assist the court on anything else? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Miss Smythe. I will be no more than the 45 minutes written. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 35. Sorry, watching. Well, I heard her and I ignored her. Ignored me. <laughs> Article 158. Let's just kick off with that very quickly. Um, with respect, nothing my learned friend really moved the dial on that one. She didn't answer the point about uh, reference to concepts uh, used, the sort of Lur Bloom line of case law I adverted to yesterday. Uh, and equally, she didn't address the point that my uh, Lord. Lord Justice Green made about the anomalous results that would entail, because of course, in that um, hole in the donut period that I averted to, uh, UK nationals in EU countries would be free to have the relevant courts in those countries refer the questions that arise in this case to that court. So if we were arguing about the Irish benefits, my learned friend keeps on referring to, and a UK national was affected by those with the fact pattern that arises in this case, that issue would be referable to the CJEU. What's anomalous about that? They're, they're, they're living in member states. It's anomalous that, that, that um, contrary to the provisions of Article 4.1, which require that the agreement 
and we want it to have the same effect in um, the EU and the UK, that there is effectively a different political reach in those circumstances. But in any event, I, I think the court understands the compass of the arguments on Article 1 by that, and I accept the main forensic challenge is showing that the case is one that's fitted for a reference. Now, I think it's fair to say that the centrepiece of my learned friend's case is really the case of Herx, the case about the Minimex back in 1985. And that's quite odd, because Herx is not the end of the story, as you might have rather got the impression. It's actually the beginning of the story. It's the first case that says, effectively, something can pass limb one of the tests, i.e. exhibits the features of social security because there's no discretion, but nevertheless it won't be a coordinated benefit because when you ask what the benefit does, it doesn't address any one of the risks identified in what is now Article 3. And that's because the only thing the Minimex was concerned was subsistence income or poverty. There were no features of the Belgian benefit that in any way addressed age, retirement, ill health, children, etc. It was just a base subsistence benefit. And it's actually the case law that comes after Herx that is relevant, the cases of which Hughes and INPS and Commission in the UK form part and parcel, because those cases clearly establish that where minimum subsistence is combined with one of the risks under the regulation. Commission in the UK, it's minimum subsistence combined with family benefits. Then that means that the regulation does apply. So you could have a minimex type structure, but if the structure is combined with something targeted at an Article 3 risk, it's a social security benefit. And it was that feature that led to the invention of the category of special non-contributory benefits. Because the whole point, particularly as reformulated by Regulation 883, the whole point of that category is to take things that look like the Minimex, but also address uh, a, a risk coordinated by the regulation, and to say, as you saw in Article 70, it says, those benefits shall not be capable of export. So I go back to the forensic challenge that I laid down right at the beginning of this case. The forensic challenge was, imagine this, six benefits, nine benefits, however many benefits you like, each addressing on a dual basis one of the risks in the regulation and the risk of poverty, each with their own separate means tests, overlapping income tests, etc., the question raised by this case is, do those other concurrent risks vanish once those benefits are consolidated into a single benefit with a unifying lowest common denominator feature, which is the addressing of poverty, because they all are concerned with the addressing of poverty, but with components or elements that are directed at the very subjects that used to be addressed by the old benefits? And our answer to that is that you cannot evade the coordination required by the regulation by combining benefits in that case by reference to a common unifying theme, which is they're all directed at poverty. And my learned friend's case is, yes, you can. And that's, in, in effect, much of the su substrate of this case, because as I showed you, it's not just a family benefit that's being coordinated here, it's also two SNCBs. And she says, effectively, when you take what are benefits and put them together, if they all have the unifying object of uh, addressing poverty, then this becomes, again, a Herx case. And that, we suggest, is a strange and radical conclusion. Now, time and again, my learned friend says, well, there's no case law from the CJU dealing with this topic. It's not addressed in the regulation. And that's true. There are no cases addressing this topic because there are no cases before the court other than Commission and Parliament addressing the situation in relation to the consolidation of benefits and the analysis that pertains in those circumstances. 
the correct answer is that that problem of effectively consolidation of benefits into one with such a unifying theme has never been addressed one way or the other. That's not a point in my learned friend's favour any more than it's a point in my favour. It's just a statement of the limitation of the case law. Commission and Parliament is, however, an exception to that because DLA was such a consolidated benefit. Uh, and I was reminded by looking back at Newton, which I'll ask you to look at shortly, Newton concerned a mobility allowance. Mobility allowance and attendance allowance were, until DLA was created in 1992, separate benefits. They were consolidated into one domestic benefit, DLA, for which there was one application. And that which had been formerly the separate benefits of mobility allowance and, mobility, uh, and care allowance became, with substantial changes, I emphasise, the components. Uh, I can provide you with the um, 2010 governmental paper. It was rather like the materials my learned friend um, put forward about universal credit describing DLA. And the care components changed. They became more generous. More people became entitled to them. But the story of DLA is actually very like the story of universal credit. It's two former benefits consolidated into one benefit, the subject of one application form, and that generated various different allowances and entitlements. And there were different scales of mobility allowance and different scales of, of um, attendance allowance. <clears throat> and if you didn't provide the information in relation to the materials, you wouldn't be given the relevant uh, increments in question. And it's that that really constitutes the backdrop to what I accept is the almost non-debate about the severability of the mobility component in DLA from the care component. And I readily accept the UK was accepting that as a fallback position and had no incentive to argue otherwise. The Commission, because of the case of Newton, which had established that mobility allowance was a, a, an invalidity benefit, wasn't seeking to argue that it couldn't be an SNCB. And that's because the practical reality is the category of SNCBs was invented, it was literally invented after Newton in order to reverse the results in Newton. That's the whole genesis. If you go back to the regulations, in Regulation 1408, introducing the amendments that introduced the new Article 10A and then Article new Annex 2A, I seem to recall the actual recital say it's effectively to address the results of the court's decision in Newton. So it would be quite a strong ask to say that the very thing the category was invented for didn't in fact encompass the mobility allowance in question. That's why there is very substantial, if you like, consensus amongst the parties about the differential status of mobility component, which had been mobility allowance, and the care component. And that's one of the difficulties in the case law. I have to accept, and I did accept at the beginning, that the case law is underpowered because this issue was almost taken as read in the case law. It hasn't been the subject of vigorous argument of the kind that we've had. But it also means <coughs> that my learned friend is wrong to suggest that all kinds of features are necessarily not relevant to the test of severance. I'll come back to it momentarily, but for instance, she said the test was dictated by how national law treats matters, and that became, in truth, an argument, that because national law calls it a component, that must mean national law is treating it as a benefit. There's no trace of that in the, in the case law or in the hypothetical uh, benefit test employed in, in Barbers. The truth is <coughs> that these issues haven't been grappled and that is the reason why this case is fit for a reference, because it's that issue that lays effectively unarticulated and unaddressed in the case law. And that's why Advocate General de la Tour's comments in the Advocate General's opinion are, are material, because they avert the fact that at least that Advocate General is thinking that there is, in relation to universal credit, an issue as to the potential uh, severability of what was the predecessor benefit, namely the CTC aspects of it, 
just as there was an issue of severance for mobility allowance as consolidated in uh, DLA. So my learned friend's quite right to say all of this is novel, but she's quite wrong to say that all of this somehow implies that we are wrong. It's just novel, and the issue hasn't been grappled with by the CJU at all. Would it be fair to say that the <coughs> first argument of the Secretary of State is that the the judge in the upper tribunal was plainly right, that there's, there's no real doubt about the answer. And your response is not that the judge in the upper tribunal was plainly wrong, but that there's so much doubt about it that the CJU needs to sort it out. Not quite, my lord. I say that the judge in the upper tribunal was plainly wrong because the thing that the judge in the upper tribunal uh, drew upon to found his conclusions were clearly not the relevant considerations. But where I do accept there is novelty is in the identification of all the factors that are relevant. So I can, I can be categorical that he was wrong to say it was not severable for the reasons he identified, but I readily recognise there is some uncertainty as to what factors are relevant to such categorisation. Now, that leads to the debate. Oh, so... The Secretary of State's position is it's clear Miss Simcova should not get but the child the the element. And your position is it's not clear she should. That needs to go to the CJU. Is that that's that, that's that's a, fair that's a, way that's of a that, it? that is a fair way of putting it, my lord. It, indeed it is. Because I think the central um, terrain for battle is whether or not the case law on categorization is a useful tool yeah. in in assisting in deciding whether or not something is severable. And again, the intellectually honest position in relation to that is to say that the case law, such as it is, Commission and Parliament and Bartlett, don't grapple with that issue. They don't engage one way or the other, beyond the hypothetical separate benefit test that we get in paragraph 21 of Bartlett. The CJU doesn't set out a toolkit to answer how you identify such a benefit. My learned friend postulates it must be to do with the fact that it's called a separate component in the domestic legislation. That, in my submission, is a deeply unsafe test for two reasons. Firstly, because all of the case law says time and time again how national law treat, chooses to label things or treat things isn't, in fact, relevant for the test of categorization. And secondly, because it leads you into debate about semantics. Why is the word component relevant, and yet an enhanced element that leads to a separate identifiable paper. I'm so sorry, but I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say it's the word component. I said it's the fact that the legislation says that each can be claimed in its own right. It's not the word component. Mm. Each of the enhanced elements can be claimed in their own right. And, and with respect, that's precisely the type of semantic debate I think that you're taken into. The reason of principle why the case law on categorization is relevant is this, and the answer the point is a logical one. It's a logical one that one makes from the case law. If this case law tells you whether or not something is or is not a social security benefit, it is telling you to focus on these particular features in order to decide whether or not it is. And it must throw from that logically that if you're asking whether a scheme contains separate benefits in the sense used by the regulation, it is those features and only those features that are relevant to categorization that tell you whether or not there is a separate benefit. Take means testing as the case in point. If means testing is not relevant to identifying whether or not something is a benefit in the sense of uh, the first limb of the test, i.e. done without discretion, then those elements must, as a matter of logic, be irrelevant to the questions of categorization. Uh, it's questions of severance. You can't, you can't let the means test drive the particular horse. Take, take DLA, for instance. Suppose at the same time as bringing together mobility allowance and attendance allowance into DLA, a means test were introduced to sit over the top of each other. And to suppose that controlled the amount of the various elements that you got. Would that be relevant to the answer in that case? My submission would be, plainly, it would not, because there would still be 
the architecture present and applying the Bartlett test, you would still be able to posit the existence of an independent benefit. It would look like the old mobility allowance, but with a means test sat on top of it. So that's why we say the categorization case law remains relevant. Can, can I just on, maybe I'm slightly taking this out of sync, but in terms of your, can I just follow through your analysis in terms of the regulation as 833 and 883 relationship sure. to the UK reg? You say, assuming you're right, you fall within matters covered in Article 3 because you're a family benefit. Correct. That chops it out. Yep. That then takes you into Article 7, uh, 67. Correct. That's stage 2, yes? Yep. That provides, in a sense, a deeming provision. Person's entitled to family benefit. Then you've got the words, in accordance with legislation of competent member state. Yep. Uh, including for his or her family members residing in another member state, as if they were residing in the former member state. So they're deemed to be residing in the UK for the purpose of the national legislation. That's right. And then you need to combine it with Article 113 to take you to the last step. Because the, because that's the bit that, you know, if you just applied Article 67, you could be deeming them to be living with the grandmother well, in a separate household. So, so that's what, that, how do you then get it into one of the categories in Article 4, the regulations? The, the last step is the application of Article 1I3. Because it's Article 1I3 that addresses the particular phenomenon of a, a fragmented household. That's exactly what it's for. And it's, it's, it, so you then get, you then, the trigger is the main dependence. Exactly. That then becomes the substantive. So it goes yeah. 3 into 67 into 1153. Correct. And then the consequence of that is the disapplication for the purposes of the test of entitlement to the supplement of the rule in Regulation 4 at 101. And effectively, what it does is disapply Regulation 4.2 and substitutes with it the test derived from Article 1.I.3. And that's simply because we're now applying old EU law and it takes precedence. Exactly. And that's, it, with respect, exactly how it would have worked and does work in relation to child tax credits. So if you look at child... Well, I'm just... I'm literally just trying to find the logic. No, absolutely. It's through a sort of chain of causation to get you back to where you want to be. So compare the, the relevant provision in relation to child tax credits, the uh, relevant um, provision akin to Regulation 4 is Regulation 3, I think it is. And that's in the supplementary bundle, tab 4. And the regulation is at page 21. And you would do exactly the same exercise and must do the same exercise. And it's accepted you must do the same exercise in that note I showed you, tab 46 in the authorities bundle, in relation to CTC. And it's that point that also answers the point made by my learned friend that, well, all of this requires fundamental violence to be done to the operation of the regulations. It's just not true. The only thing that happens and needs to happen is the disapplication for the purposes of the entitlement to the child element of Regulation 4.2. Because all Regulation 4.2 does is qualify the concept of responsibility of the child for the purposes of Section 10, uh, which is the provisions um, leading to the child element. And the, uh, the other... Uh, uh, examples that are given to sh show um, how all of this would create confusion, etc., with respect, simply don't stack up. So, um, if you look at paragraph 29 on the learned friend skeleton argument, it's the point she reiterated orally, and the example she gave, I think, was the first one. So, you, so um, can I just go back a stage? Of course, ma'am. You say all that needs to happen is you disapply regulation 4. 4 2 of the universal credit regulations. Yes. But Miss Smythe says that, that brings you not only the child element, but a different amount for housing costs, 
and various other knock-on effects. That was the point I was just about to address, my lord. Um, the first answer to it is you only need to disapply it for the purposes for which you're disapplying it, which is testing entitlement to the um, uh, child element as opposed to any other element. So the disapplication is only for the purposes of the child element because it's only the child element that amounts to a family benefit, unless you can point to something else amounting to the benefit. The EU law won't require you to disapply the inconsistent provision. It only disapplies it to the extent required. That's the first point. The second point is that when you take up the examples given, and Miss My pointed to paragraph 29.1, and she said, well, if you look at the provisions of um, the relevant uh, uh, legislation at 126 to 128, you'll see that that creates similar problems. Uh, could you turn up 126 to 128? This is the housing benefit example. What she alights upon at 127 is G, a child or qualifying young person. Oh, yes, it is G. Child or your qualifying young person for whom no one in the renter's extended benefit unit is responsible. But the point is, you don't get into any of these problems because you look at the controlling condition. A person is a non-dependent if they live in the accommodation and none of the following applies. And if you go back to 9.1, for the person who is scheduled, the members of the renter's extended benefit unit are the renters and any child or qualifying young person for whom the renter or either joint renter is responsible, you don't need to dis disapply the ordinary test of responsibility here because it's not in connection with the relevant child benefit. Do you challenge the proposition that even on a fairly standard process of disapplication to the, to the extent required, there's still going to be some reorganisation of the system? I mean... Well, uh, that's inevitable. That, you may say it's irrelevant. That is, with respect, it was presented as somehow anathema to the harm uh, to the coordination function of the regulation that it should lead in any way to any change in domestic law. And I found, I have to say, that submission very hard to follow because in every single case where the regulation has been successfully invoked in relation to a case of export or to attack a residence rule. The consequence is the disapplication of the relevant rule imposing the residence test. If you go to Newton, for instance, well, that just follows as a matter of ordinary, the fact that the regulation is directly applicable. Yeah, if you go to Newton, for instance, Newton's tab 19, you'll see that it's about the old mobility allowance before its consolidation into DLA. You'll see at paragraph 19 of the court's judgment in Newton that the consequence of the argument that it was an invalidity benefit being accepted was that the Social Security Commissioner had to disapply the residence test that was applied. That was what the whole debate was about in Newton, because Mr Newton had moved to France. And it was the move to France that meant he was no longer resident in the UK that disentitled him to the benefits. And that was, as my learned friend says, a true export case because the claimants themselves had moved. It's exactly the same in the case of Hughes, where a Sorry, resident... Just, just, um, you get that from the words, must be treated as. Exactly. If you look at the case of Hughes, it's another case where the residence test was disapplied. If you look at the case of Stuart... It's another export case. It was about a fairly recondite child version of DLA. Uh, Lucy Stewart had moved to France. The reason the Secretary of State was saying she shouldn't be entitled to the benefit was because she no longer satisfied the residence test. It was an invalidity benefit. She was entitled under the invalidity provisions to set aside the residence requirement. That's what this regulation does. And the idea that this is somehow contrary to its objective of, uh, of coordination, not harmonisation, 
is unsupportable. My learned friend took you to um, the passage in um, Commission in the UK and suggested that um, somehow that supported the, the idea that there was no violence to be done to the language of the regulation. But if you read the paragraph she referred you to, it actually culminates by saying, unless, I can find the exact words that you can use it, save as otherwise supplemented by uh, EU law or something of that kind, that makes it absolutely plain that in an appropriate case, there will be a requirement to disapply a national provision. So with respect, the fact that it's a coordination measure, not a harmonisation measure, is no kind of fundamental answer to the exercise we're advocating. And the sort of forensic excision in relation to Regulation 4.2 that we advocate is forensically identical, or no material difference to, those already made in cases where residence-based arguments have succeeded. So that can't be right. So where we get to, oh, it's also suggested that we're seeking to uh, suggest that EU law doesn't apply at all in relation to the benefits and by uh, suggesting that the consequence is the evasion of the regulation, we're avoiding the fact that other EU law principles may apply. Our argument about evasion was about evasion of the consequences of the regulation and its specific export or residence-based rules. It's um, no part of our case to, to say that there is no other EU law argument that can be made. The rule might have been attacked as indirect discrimination on grounds of nationality, contrary to, let's say, Article 12 of the Withdrawal Agreement. But that's not the argument before the court. It's not my case to say no such arguments can be made. My case is that what is happening in consequence of this argument is that the proper operation of the coordination regulation is being evaded. So we come back time and time again to the issue of principle being how are you to approach uh, severance. And as to the irrelevance of national law or legal provisions on severance, my learned friend's case really gets into something of intellectual knots in the sense that she says that you have to look at the provisions of domestic law to answer the question of severance. There's no authority for that in either Commission and Parliament or, with respect, Barnett. But it boils down to an argument that says if, if national law is saying or indicating it's a separate benefit, even though it's one benefit, then you win. And if it's not, then you don't. But that's no test of anything at all. That's just a test of if it's anything at all of saying national law treats these things as two benefits. And the test can't be as uh, light as that, and it's certainly not as clearly so. So the answer is not whether or not national law calls it a separate benefit or a component or anything of that kind. It's a test of substance, and that's what has to be explored. Otherwise, we're in the terrain of semantics. Uh, repeatedly, we said, well... Other member states have the same sorts of system. Look at what they do in Ireland. Other member states have consolidated all their benefits, etc. To which the answer is, well, that's all jolly interesting. But unless and until there's a case actually saying, well, you've consolidated what were SNCBs or social security benefits in this um, unified wrapper, and for that reason there still remain severable components, and until there's a court answering that argument, the response is, so what? Just because other people do things doesn't mean that it's lawful. So that doesn't really take one anywhere. And there was no suggestion that the Irish legislation footnoted in my learned friend's skeleton argument has anything like the unusual features of this case, which is drawing upon and bringing together at least three benefits that were, in fact, subject to the operation of the regulation. Uh, as for the test of substance, we do think it's important that there is this uh, uh, additional element feature of the legislation, sections 10 through to 12 of the Act, 
effectively act as signposts for the subjects that were the subjects of the previous benefits. Section 10 is the signpost for what was CTC, and it takes you into the uh, enhanced elements for children and the regulation for the test. Mm -hmm. Section 12, which you looked at this morning, is actually the signpost for the old employment support allowance means tested benefit uh, and all the concepts for limited capacity for work and limited capacity for work related activity are exactly the same concepts that were in that old benefit that were discussed in the Al Hashem case which concerned that benefit before it was consolidated into universal credit. Uh, then my learned friends uh, raised the case of Carrington and with respect I really don't understand where this takes us. Uh, it's no part of our case to say that the UK can cease to be the competent authority for a family benefit if Miss Simkova goes back to Slovakia. She hasn't. It is competent, it is, if we're right, just as it is competent in relation to everyone with her fact pattern who continues to have child tax credit rather than um, universal credit. <clears throat> that being so, it must be the case that HMRC have grappled with all of the issues identified. It must be the case that HMRC have grappled in particular with the phenomenon of overlapping benefits. That was the point I made this morning. I said, none of this can come as news. You must be doing all of this already in relation to CTC, and you must be addressing already HMRC when and you are and are not uh, the relevant competent authority. You must have procedures for doing that. So the argument really comes down to the fact that doing so in relation to this portion of universal credit will require you to make changes to the system. And that can't be a proper argument to a requirement of the law. My learned friend then seeks to say, well, if it requires such changes, that must be a pointer to the fact that the analysis is wrong. And that fails, I'm afraid, uh, simply as a matter of logic. So where you get to, in, in the end, in my submission, is this. You've got two cases, and what you might style as a um, Delphic remark. I'm not sure it is that Delphic, but I'm not sure it has a huge amount of weight. You have uh, two cases, and... Uh, footnote, genuinely it's a footnote, in an Advocate General's opinion, addressing the core topic raised by this case, a novel fact scenario, and a scenario in which, if accepted, my learned friend's argument is one that permits a member state simply to consolidate all of its mean-tested benefits that fall within the scope of the regulation, and upon so doing, say, aha, it all now falls out. And that is a fairly drastic conclusion. And it is one that the CJEU, if there is power to refer the case to it, should be invited to answer. If you conclude there is no such power, then my submission is very clearly one in which I say CTC survives. The features that have been alighted upon by the um, uh, upper tribunal judge are not relevant, the means testing, etc. The relevant question is, could it hypothetically be a separate benefit? to which the answer is, of course it bleed in can, it was and is called CTC. And that's my submission. And it's really not a submission, so very different to the arguments made, um, I would suspect, in relation to disability, living allowance, mobility component, and the old predecessor benefit of mobility allowance. It's really not so very different. There's a spectrum represented by Commission and Parliament at one end and Al Hashem at the other end. It's jolly close to the... Uh, to the mobility allowance end of the spectrum. Thank you very much. And can I say, uh, which I should have said first thing yesterday, thank you very much for accommodating me by listing this hearing uh, at two o'clock starting yesterday. That was greatly appreciated. Right, well, as um, Lord Justice Green has already intimated, we will reserve our judgment. <laughs> <laughs> you will get a draft in the usual way. It comes under an embargo, the contents of which must be uh, respected. Uh, we would hope that in the light of the draft judgments we'll be able to agree in order, disposing of the appeal, but if you can't agree in order, uh, please make short submissions in writing and we will see where we go from there. The receipt of the draft is of course your opportunity to correct our English but not our reasoning and not to introduce new arguments.
heaven forbid. Thank you all very much. Oh,